This is Ashish Ad Bedekar and welcome to my podcast the ARB show. I am thrilled to introduce today's guest Dimitri. Dimitri is a full full stack startup advisor. He helps tech companies get off the ground in domestic and international markets. He has helped build two unicorns as member of their founding teams and led teams at companies like Edwin Buddy AI which was a Y combinator uh, winter of 18th company. Evernote, Lingua Leo, Site Path. Earlier, he has written lots of code for several Boston-based startups, built numerical climate models, and did field studies of Arctic and mountain glacial climates. With three exits, two CEO postings, and multiple pivots, he brings a wealth of experience. And I don't think you can find a better guide and mentor to talk about. international international expansion uh, over to you dimitri do share your life journey and what you have planned for 2024 uh, hi ashish uh, thank you for the invitation and uh, for such a kind uh, uh, intro uh, well we actually if you remember we met in the context of uh, evernote international expansion to india right so and yeah it's, it's good, good to see you um what you described is uh, the short version of uh, my uh, life <laughs> uh, journey uh, i uh, started as a field researcher on, on arctic and uh, mountain glaciers and uh, now i am working with innovative companies in silicon valley uh, international expansion is uh, one of uh, the things that uh, I love doing so happy to share what I know. Excellent, excellent. Uh thank thanks Dimitri. So as we discussed, I would like to have a format where the guest talks about top 5 tips in a specific domain of their expertise. And since you are an expert in international expansion, uh, I would invite you to talk about the top 5 tips for international expansion and that would be something which would be really very helpful for the audience. Uh, with that uh, over to you dimitri uh, what in your view is the first uh, you know tip which you would like to give the audience so first tip is uh, why why to go global and uh, there are five reasons to do that it's a uh, new customers is driving you uh, partnerships capital talent and the risk diversification uh, new customers and revenue uh, it's kind of obvious but the the way i think about it it's your way to leverage the investments you make into your product and your marketing at a larger user base um, at some point it makes perfect sense and we'll talk about when next partnerships again you go to new region there are new local and multinational companies based there Uh, that's actually how we met. Um, going back to the Evernote experience by launching in Japan, uh, Evernote gained a few partners like Docomo and uh, Canon. But at some point, it starts helping you in your home market and your co-markets as well. It's a, it's a good leverage. Uh, capital. Uh, this is uh, more for companies that come to the U.S. Uh, still, uh, Silicon Valley is the major source of venture uh, capital. Uh, talent. Um, the old definition of international was uh, selling uh, internationally. The new definition of international company is uh, building globally. It's becoming more and more important. And finally, uh, risk uh, diversification. Self-explanatory. The events of the last few years reinforce, remind us about the importance of risk management, um, and this is especially important if you're coming from a smaller market. Right, right. So that's a very valid point as to you know how companies should look at 
international expansion as a means to grow right as a part of the growth journey mm-hmm. so can you give some insights on you know companies which probably are uh, in a comfort zone right they're doing well in their domestic market or so and uh, maybe they don't look at international expansion uh, that seriously and that kind of comes back to haunt them and uh, you know maybe there's some uh, they face some uh, you know uh, crisis or they have some major challenges and they wished that you know uh, maybe if they had multiple markets it could have saved them have you come across any uh, any uh, kind of startup or company which kind of learned the the lesson the hard way uh, well historically japanese companies were very comfortable in their home market and somewhat reluctant to go internationally. Uh, that has changed when uh, Japan entered the great stagnation. China is another example. Uh, actually, Chinese companies uh, tried to break out of this huge domestic market for a long time. And for a long time, they were failing. Frankly, and lately they started succeeding. So this is a right. very interesting right. development in the U.S. Um, so Evernote that we mentioned was the first time I got exposure to to this. Before that, I was playing technical roles. So it was back to, in 2008, and at the time it was very unconventional for a scrappy startup to go to new markets. The traditional way was like, okay, you said you establish yourself in North America and in several years, maybe you open an office in London and maybe in Singapore. And you, you open an office by hiring lawyers and uh, accountants. Then you go from there. Um, our playbook was very different and that became a norm. So these days, American companies, California companies, uh, start looking at uh, new markets much sooner in their life. Got it. Got it. Excellent. Excellent. So that was a very good point as to why one needs to look at uh, international uh, expansion. So what would be the second tip which you would like to give uh, to the audience? Uh, well, so we discussed why. Let's talk about when. And uh, that's somewhat counterintuitive, but um, what I learned is that expanding to new markets before you find your product market fit is very risky. Uh, it's defocusing, it increases your risks. So a startup should focus on its core market first. And I learned this from, from the experience. Uh, Edwin, AI, English tutor, um, was targeting Korean and Japanese uh, markets. And uh, I worked in these markets before. I, I, I thought that I understood it. That's where we started. And it turned out that we underestimated uh, the complexities of this market. So focus on your core market, gain, gain traction, improve your product and your team, and then go into it. Got it, got it. So, so that's that's a very well uh, well thought of thing. So, when you're talking of when, and let's say a startup has got a good foothold in its domestic market, uh, would you then recommend that they first, uh, you know, kind of see amongst their existing partners in the domestic market, uh, whichever partner has, let's say, an international, uh, you know, arm or international wing, you kind of leverage that to uh, kind of grow. Is that something what you would recommend? Uh, yeah, yeah, that that could be one of uh, your distribution channels, uh, channels of growth. Um, I wouldn't rely exclusively on a partner, but that could give you a leg up uh, in uh, in a new geography. Now, like um, the core market doesn't have to be the market where you live, uh, some, especially like, uh, smaller uh, startups in smaller countries, uh, they often launch uh, elsewhere, and that becomes there. The uh, core market doesn't have to be your domestic market. 
got it got it and uh, so when you say core market are you also referring to a specific uh, vertical also so for example let's say you you start and you have a good traction in let's say uh, for example uh, hospitality as a vertical uh, and you are there present in a specific geography so you know what essentially i hear you say is get that thing as a solid base because that's the foundation for you to leverage or uh, leverage that to go to somewhere else but if your foundation is weak then you won't get that success essentially that's what you're saying yeah that's right that's right i was talking about uh, geographies but the same applies to uh, market verticals excellent 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 um, now again every rule has exceptions uh, but exceptions are rare and if you think that you're an exception think again exactly exactly so i mean it's it's the classical thing that uh how do you uh, you know uh, why did you make a mistake because you didn't have experience and how do you how do you get experience by making mistakes right so yep. so that it's it's a journey right you have to go through the grind and you know there's no uh, standard answer for everything great so what what in your uh, view is the third tip which uh, you know anyone should focus on uh, when they are considering international expansion So we talked about why and we talked about when let's talk about where so uh, to select your new market consider the following factors upside versus risk barriers to entry cost and your product and team readiness uh, let's uh, let's unpack this upside versus risk uh, this is about expected uh, impact on uh, your strategic goals uh launching a new in a new geography takes a lot of effort and if you don't expect it to move the needle just just don't don't bother barriers to entry and there are very different barriers there are cultural barriers there are regulatory barriers there are geopolitical barriers there are competitive barriers uh, you shouldn't be like, intimidated by these but you should understand it just do your research uh cost and readiness think through product localization uh, the effort the opportunity cost um, when i say product localization i mean it in a broad sense it's not just translating your user interface it's, uh, it's content it's machinery it's payments it's integration into the local ecosystem like all these things uh, also learn about the market uh, and the uh, culture that's a, that's a, an important aspect of your readiness do you understand it or do you have people who understand it? Mm-hmm. and make local connections uh, that's again uh, coming back to uh, the way we met uh, Evernote was reasonably su- 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 successful in India because, because we had uh, colleagues that could guide us through the complexities of this market right 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 very true very true so here since you talked about japan uh what what was the specific uh you know care which you took in terms of uh, leveraging partnerships leveraging uh the necessary networks to understand the market uh, quite well uh because you know as as uh, you know many of us would agree that even if a simple thing like a website uh the whole ui or ux approach uh for a website uh which is catering to let's say a north american audience versus if that website is supposed to cater to a japanese audience it is totally different right because in japanese websites it will be extremely busy right it will be text all over the place uh you know full of text which in normal uh ui ux thing is not a recommended thing but in japan that's what is recommended right so such nuances how did you uh, how did you kind of uh, understand what needs to be done uh, in in japan ah uh, this is actually a interesting that you brought it up and it's a counter example so when uh, when we started working on uh, Uh, the launch in Japan we were told that we should change everything and um, so we asked uh, okay yes tell us what exactly we have to change them. everything yeah, and in particular people mentioned that uh, in Japan and several other markets people are used to very high 
information density on the screen. And we asked like why we were explained and we didn't do anything. We didn't. Uh, same story was repeated when we went to China. Again, you have to change everything, change, start with your website. We didn't do it like well. So, um, sometimes the common wisdom doesn't apply to you. <laughs> um, so, but, so, that was a counterexample, but um, Japan was a special case for us. Uh, so, our CEO, Phil Libin, was a big fan of Japan. Uh, he put a lot of like, his personal effort and in, uh, time into that. Alex Pachikov, who you may take a bet, uh, was very involved. And um, early on, the key partner and key channel for, that, for us was uh, Dokomo, ma major uh, Japanese uh, telecom. Uh, they really helped us. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Great. So we have covered around three tips. Uh, what would be the fourth tip uh, in your view? Uh, well, now let's talk about how. Um, so, to, to be successful internationally, you, your product and your company needs to be global ready. And that involves uh, almost all business functions. Uh, product and engineering, marketing, support, legal, finance, developer relations. Uh, this means that um, Team International has to be cross-functional by definition, right? So International is a cross-functional thing. So it's important to set up the right organizational structure for the team international. Um, there are probably multiple ways to do that. The way it works best from my experience is to set it up as an, as an autonomous unit with its own targets and uh, vision. It, it better has its own charter. Uh, In a startup, head of international should report to the CEO. That's the way to make sure that the international has enough influence to make things happen. Uh, as a company gets bigger, it, like, reporting could be to CEO, CRO, or revenue officer. Uh, but again, people who run international need to have enough cloud to pull in resources and people from other teams. Now, as you build up your international organization, you, you need more people. But it doesn't mean that you have to hire for international. For example, like, you need to do a design of a website for a new geography. Um, if you run international, your instinct is to engage your own designer. Usually, my advice would be don't. Uh, talk to people who run design for the whole company and uh, make sure that they have this resource. They, they, can, they can make it another function of uh, some of the existing designers who hire uh, a new person. But this way, people who work on international projects are integrated in their vertical function and it usually works better. <laughs> uh, this is about headquarters. Uh, you need people on the ground. These are your eyes and uh, ears. It's super important that you have the right people. Uh, these folks, they will have less direction, less supervision by definition. Right? They are many time zones away. So they need to be entrepreneurial and they need to be empowered. You have to trust them and you have to support them from the headquarters. At Evernote, at uh, Lingualeo, at Edwin, at Buddy, we call these people market development. And these are like jack of all trades, universal soldiers who are technical enough to understand uh, the product enough to get meaningful feedback from users and feed it back. 
they don't have to be PR person, PR people, but they should know how to work with uh, like local PR people, PR agency. Um, and depending on the market, sometimes the main function could be partnerships. Uh, that that was the case for Everdot in Japan. Uh, sometimes it's uh, developer relations. Uh, some time, uh, th that was the case for Evernote in Korea. Uh, sometimes it's uh, paid user acquisition. That, that's what uh, was the focus of market development people at Lingwali and Bajaj. Excellent, excellent. So I think that's a that's a very nice and succinct uh, elaboration of what should be the kind of market or organization structure. And also what you said is a very interesting and relevant thing that you need to have proper linkage between the parent organization and the autonomous thing for knowledge transfer and for a faster response uh, without mm -hmm. getting into the bureaucratic thing. So very valid. Uh, what would be the, the fifth uh, uh, kind of tip we should like to give? Well, another another how. So, how do you enter new market? What's your go-to-market in a new geography? Uh, when starting this planning, revisit your old core market playbook. Go over the tactics that you used during your zero to one phase. What I found is that sometimes companies forget about it by the time they go international. Uh, it takes an effort, but like, that's what you should do. Like, you are back to zero to one, right? So your your men mentality, your mental model, your organization is already in like one to like, end, and you have to go back to that. Remember how you've done it. Um, review it, whether it's applicable to the new geography, uh, but then go and go through the whole gamut of uh, marketing tactics that are available to you. Come right. up with a new playbook. Right. So essentially, you know, it's it's essentially it's the have the same passion as uh, what you had when you were starting up because every every new market is a startup in itself, right? So so that's uh, that's, that's right. That's exactly, right. exactly. Yeah. So, uh, Dimitri, the same passion, the same discipline, and the same drive. You exactly. are back to zero to one. Exactly. So, in your view, can you share some experiences in which you know few international experiences or expansion went really well, and you really had an aha moment in terms of yes, this is something really great. Uh, also, maybe uh, if you can share uh, examples of uh, some international moves or expansions which did not go as per plan, and uh, your learnings from there. Uh, let me see. Uh, I've not in China. So, first time we looked at this market uh, three years after we started international expansion. We have launched already in Japan, UK, Russia, and four European countries. And uh, I was asked to go to China and figure out if we could and should launch. That was my first trip to China, 2010. I was uh, shocked. <laughs> I had no idea. I, I was very impressed with the dynamism and the potential in the market, but also with the complexity. Uh, so when I came back, my answer was that, like, yes, absolutely, this is an important market, and no, we are not ready. As an organization, we just didn't have enough organizational maturity and uh, resources. So instead of going straight to China, we launched in India, we launched in Brazil, we launched in Taiwan and Singapore, and we came back in a year and a half. Um, the part of the problem was re regulation. Uh, you needed internet content provider license. Only local Chinese entities and citizens could do that, so we need a local partner. The existing, well, the traditional way of partnering with the, with the Chinese 
clearly didn't work. There were several high profile failures at that time. So it was a big deal. Um, to be, we, we ended up finding a perfect partner. We had to host data centers within the Great Firewall of China and the, and the mainland. Uh, we, we had a local team. It was the largest international operation of any. After we launched, uh, our CEO said that this was the largest project the company ever undertook. It was even bigger than the initial launch, but that's because just the company was bigger. And pretty quickly, China became the second to the US in terms of users and the third after the US and Japan in terms of revenue, which is exactly where it shouldn't be. Um, now, that was 2012. Unfortunately, the world has changed. I don't think uh, today we would do that. Just geopolitics is different. And that's, that's very unfortunate. Um, so I consider this to be a very successful launch. Um, major effort, major payback. Launches that didn't go that well. Well, I mentioned um, Edwin uh, experience. Edwin was a, a AI teacher of English as a foreign language. And we specifically focused on uh, students that um, had to prepare for standardized tests. So we built last what we called last mile course for tests like TOEFL, TOEIC. It's a high high uh, high stake test that uh, almost every professional in. Korea and Japan take. So that was our geographic focus, Korea and Japan. Um, we did a market test. It went very well. We convinced ourselves that we understand uh, the markets. We launched. We, we actually built pretty sophisticated technology and product. But when we launched, we discovered that uh, there was zero market demand. Uh, we underestimated how conservative these societies were with regard to education. Basically, what happened is that uh, there was a, and there is still is a well-established way to prepare for this standardized test. People go to cram schools. That's what, that's, okay, I should call them prep schools. Uh, these are god-awful, people hate it. Uh, it's public of pub, it's a subject of public deba debate. It's understood that they are grossly inefficient, but that's how things have, has been done several generations and it's really hard to change this behavior and there's a pretty startup out of california we just couldn't do that exactly so, lesson learned so we pivoted into something else that that's that's actually an example of the risk when you are launching globally before you establish your product market business. Excellent, excellent. Thanks, thanks, Dimitri. This really gives a great perspective. And, uh, you know, this was kind of a distilled uh, wisdom and distilled expertise, which I'm sure everyone would really uh, find it very useful. And uh, thank you, dear listeners, for tuning in. Do subscribe, share, and like this podcast. Bye for now. Talk to you soon.